and um here in the philippines this is monday evening for us and it's your monday morning so wow um last week did we really have a good time right we did my goodness and uh, even after the session uh, I saw some messages in the group chat saying like how wonderful the, the teaching was and it's it's good and we learned some strategies on how to teach the uh, the creation to the children and oh my it was the topic of the week Pastor Craig and uh, and we're just really blessed um, to have you and as we continue uh, let's um, uh, let's have an opening prayer and um, I would like to. Um, uh, uh, I, I, I think I can see about 25 people here, right? Okay. I, I would like to, um, call Mom Lenny. I think you're here. Mom mm -hmm. Lenny, could you please open us in prayer? Okay, let us pray. Good evening to everyone and good morning to Pastor Carol and Pastor Craig. Okay, so let us pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for this opportunity to learn more about your word, O oh Lord God. Thank you for the presence of each and everyone. Thank you, Father God, for good internet connection, O Lord God. And Father, as we start this seminar, Father, I pray that you will bless our speaker. Uh, anoint him with your triple portion of your anointing, O Lord God. And thank you for this teaching, Father God. Thank you for his life, O Lord God. Use him more for your glory and to bless your people tonight, O Lord God. Thank you, Father God. Bless all the lessons that was prepared, O Lord God. And it will be a blessing to all of us. Thank you, Father God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Mom Lenny. Uh, Sister Lenny is actually one of the core group here in uh, of the Philippine Values Education Program. And she has sure. been with us. And uh, she started as a volunteer teacher, actually. And that's when she was just uh, a, a college student. And so until now, she is still part of the program. <laughs> And um, it's a privilege and it's an honor to call her my niece. Wonderful. So anyway, tonight, I think uh, folks, uh, we're not going to uh, do a long, long introduction so we can have more time with our lecturer. And I think we already realized that he is truly a Bible teacher. Last week, oh my God, it was such a wonderful time. And uh, like, uh, I, I don't know uh, if you did like what I did. I have several pages of notes on my notebook and also at the same time writing on my own book. Anyway, it's mine, Pastor Craig. So <laughs> I, I was uh, trying to write everything as much as I can. And uh, for those of you who just joined tonight, uh, Pastor Craig has been a missionary to Ukraine for uh, for number of years with uh, with his wife Dorothy, and um, and and now that uh, they are retired, actually uh, I I can't see him retired because you know look at him lecturing not just to the people in Canada, in Ukraine, but also here in the Philippines. So I don't think uh, th that's called retirement, but actually uh, God had uh, made this uh, maybe uh, a transition in his life for him to reach more uh, countries. And that's why he is reaching us now. Wow, what an amazing God we do serve. Mm -hmm. And so, um, uh, uh, he has been um, uh, a pastor for a number of years and a missionary and with all of the experiences that he had with Dorothy and in the mission field. And it, it's really a great privilege for us, uh, Pastor Greg, to have Pastor Craig to have you and uh, uh, with all of your expertise. And of course, you know, um, as a Bible teacher, I know that uh, we will learn more from you. So thank you for this privilege, and I know that uh, as we uh, as we continue, we will come to know more about him, and 
And uh, I think we are all enjoying his teaching right now. This is just the second uh, session, but I, I know uh, we're looking forward to it. And like what I have said, Pastor Craig, it's been our topic the whole week. And <laughs> from time to time, it just pops up like, oh, wow. So anyway, um, I, I'm not going to uh, say so much. I, um, I would like to give now the microphone to Pastor Craig because I know we are all looking forward to this session. Thank you, Pastor Craig. Thank you, Jocelyn, for your very kind words. Sometimes I think uh, you're too kind, but that's, that's very, very good of you. And I'm, I'm glad you're taking lots of notes. Uh, I think you've got more notes than I have. Uh, but God bless you for that. We, we talk about the fire of the Holy Spirit, you know, and uh, how we want to have the fire in our bones. And sometimes when I get so much paper notes, I say, well, it takes a little paper to start a fire, you know. So you've got a real good fire going there, Jocelyn. God bless you. That's wonderful. And uh, I just welcome everybody that has joined our group today. Uh, I pray that God will open up our understanding. Mine as well. Every time I open the Bible, I just say, God, show me fresh things from your word. Remember, Jesus said that out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And we know there's a difference between a flowing water and just water that collects in a pond and gets little bugs in it and all that, because it doesn't flow. But when the water flows, it stays fresh. And I, I just want the water of the Holy Spirit to keep flowing through my life so that his word is always fresh to me. It never grows stale. It's, it's the bread of life that never grows stale. Now, we're, we're working through this book that I've uh, got, and I think that uh, many of you have this book. And so if you have it, it might help you even to have it near you now, because I'm going to refer to a few things that are in this book right now. So uh, if you turn to page six of your notes, that's where we're going to start today, and only the Lord knows where we're going to finish. Uh, eventually, as we go through our study, we're, we've started out at the very beginning at creation, and we're going to go to heaven, and we're going to go beyond heaven, and we're going to discover amazing things about the second coming of Jesus and about heaven and what awaits for us in heaven. So many people say, well, we don't, we, we can't know the, the, you know, what's ahead. Uh, we can only just imagine it. No, we can know many things. We don't know everything, that's for sure. But we can know many things. And the things that we know make us realize God has a wonderful, wonderful plan for us. So I just want to keep following Jesus. And I want Jesus to be always at the center of my life. Okay, so we were talking about the week of creation in Genesis chapter 1. And uh, if you look at page six of your notes, you realize that, uh, and I did this on, on the board last week, how when I wrote the days of creation, I made it as a chart where day one and day four were opposite each other, day two and day five were opposite each other, and day three and day six were opposite each other. The reason is, there's a relation between day one and four. Day one, God said, let there be light. Day four was the sun and the moon. They're both light days. Day two was an air and water day. Day five, the birds and fish day. So again, air and water, kind of, re they relate. Day three was the first, well, was when the water, uh, the earth actually rises out of the water and then life comes up out of the earth and its vegetation. And so uh, the, the day three is really the first day of life. It's vegetable life or, or uh, plant life, but it's life. And then when you go over to day six, again, there's life. It's animals at first, and then God creates man out of the dust of the earth. And so that's amazing. And then day seven, is a rest day. 
Desa, and this is something that's really, really important, and I'll come back to this a little bit later today, where on day seven, it said God rested from the work that he had done. Now, that's interesting because God comes along in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 1, and it says, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 1 says, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. Finished. That's a very, very important word. Do you know that there are three times in the Bible that the Bible says God finished something that he had started? And those three are very significant events. This is the first one, and it's the days of creation. God said, it's finished. There's no more work to do. And so that's Genesis chapter 2 and verse 1. But then we go over into John chapter 19 and verse 30, where Jesus is on the cross. He has paid the price for our salvation. He has given his life and shed his blood. And now the work of our salvation is finished. And on the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. Oh, I think that's just so wonderful. That makes my heart want to really rejoice. Here, creation was finished in Genesis 1. Now the new creation is finished in John chapter 19 and verse 30. Because first or 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away, and everything has become new. Isn't that wonderful? And you can even nod your head if you understand what I'm saying, because I can see some of you, and I think that's a great, a great truth, isn't it? That Jesus finished the work. Now, I said that there are three times that the Bible records it's finished. The first is in Genesis at creation. The second is Jesus on the cross at the new creation, because he paid the penalty for us, and it is finished. Salvation's work is done. Then the third time is at the very end of the Bible, Heavens, uh, when, when we're in heaven. the um, uh, Revelation chapter 21 and verse 6. Let me, let me read a Revelation, the last book of the Bible, and verse 6. It says, he said to me, it is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Oh, that's wonderful. And that's why when we look at the chart, see, we start with the word with, with Alpha. That's the first letter of the Greek alphabet. And we go to the very last letter, which is Omega, which is like saying from A to Z. From all the alpha, every letter is there. Jesus is everything. Everything God has to say, he said it in Jesus. That's why Jesus is called the Word of God, because there's nothing more to say than God said in Jesus. And so Jesus says at the very end, when heaven is finally ready for us, he said, it's finished. I am Alpha and omega, what I start, I finish. What I do is good, and what I will do in the days ahead is good. God always does what's good. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, being confident or sure of this thing, that he who began a good work, a good work, will finish it. Oh, I'm so glad about that. And so we'll come back to that day in just a minute. So watch this. We talked about the days of creation. I'm not going to repeat everything I said last week, but we finally get to day seven. And day seven is again, as I've just said, the day of rest. God rested. The work was finished. Now, here's something that you really need to understand and think about. Adam and Eve work, what day of the week were they created? Day six, we know that. In fact, it was the last part of day six. 
And so now listen to this. That means that Adam and Eve's first day, first full day of life on earth was a day of rest. They didn't have any work to do. The first thing that they had to do is to rest. Wow. Now that's really amazing. And there's, a, there's something in that for us because we need to realize that Jesus is the one who did the work of salvation. And when we come to Jesus, we need to rest in the work that he finished. There's no more work for us. Titus 3 verse 5 says, it's not by works of righteousness that I have done, but according to his mercy that he saved us. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 says that we're saved by grace through faith, and it's not of my, my works. Jesus did the work. And so what I need to do is rest in what Jesus has already done. That's why it's, it's really important to remember that Adam and Eve's first full day of life on earth was to rest in the work that God had done and that God had finished. It was finished. They rested. Now, they did have work to do. They didn't just sit around and do nothing in the days ahead, but work didn't start until they rested. They had to rest first, then they get to work. And we have much work to do for God, but there's a principle there where we need to learn to rest in Jesus. Even as we walk through life, we realize that there are challenges that come and things that we need to give our attention to. But the first thing I do when I, I'm facing one of those problems or a lot of work is I come to Jesus and I say, Jesus, this is not my work, it's yours. And I rest in you. Give me faith just to trust you and let my life rest in you today. And in other words, everything I do as a Christian begins with resting, resting in the promises. There's another way of saying that. It's called faith, where by faith, I just trust the Lord. I don't have to stir things up and hard work at it. I just say, Jesus, I trust you. That's faith. That's rest. And that's why in Hebrews chapter uh, 4, it says, we who have believed do enter his rest. Oh, that's wonderful. Believing. We who have faith enter his rest. I'll talk more about that a little bit later because I'm still not done on that topic. But let's go to the second column on page six of your notes. I've called it the story of Jesus. This is so exciting because I realize that when I get into this, um, this uh, view of creation, that God has actually hidden a story there about Jesus, his birth, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his, his life on earth, his second coming. It's all. Did you know that that's in the very first chapter of the Bible? Well, let, let me explain. Day one of creation, God said, let there be light. That is a picture. It's like an illustration. It's a picture of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why do I say that? Because we know that Jesus is the light of the world. Um, and in Matthew chapter 4, talking about the coming of Jesus, it says in Matthew 4 verse 19, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. That's talking about Jesus. People who sat in spiritual darkness have seen a great light upon those who sat in the region and the shadows of death. Light has dawned. That's Jesus coming into the world. That's why Isaiah chapter 60 
verses 1 and 2. He prophesied, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Whoa, that's great. Or John chapter 1, verse 5, it talks about Jesus coming. You know, it's interesting, The uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all talk about the birth of Jesus in a different way. But when John talks about the birth of Jesus, he just says, the word became flesh. And then he says, the light shone in darkness, Jesus. Now, it's interesting. Jesus is the light of the world. And I don't think it's a coincidence that God chose nighttime for Jesus to be born. And what happened to the night sky when Jesus was born? It was filled with the glory and the brightness of the Lord as the angels appeared to the shepherds. A blinding light shone in the sky when Jesus was born. When Jesus died, what time of the day was it when Jesus died? It was right in the middle of the day at noon when the sun was the brightest. And what happened to the bright sky? When Jesus died, it became dark. Why? Because the light of the world was dying on the cross. That, that's more than a coincidence to me. When I see those kinds of things, I think, Jesus, you are the light of the world. And remember what I said last week? When we go through the days of creation, it says every day, it says the evening and the morning were the first day. The evening and and the morning were the second day. Well, we, we don't talk of days that way. We say the morning and the evening were the first. We start with morning, and then when we come to evening, as you are right now in the evening, you're saying our day is coming to an end, and we wait for the dawning of a new day when the light comes tomorrow. In other words, our day starts with light and ends in darkness. God's day doesn't start that way. God said the evening and the morning were the first. God might start in the dark, but he'll always end in the light. He comes into my life when the darkness of sin has brought darkness and, 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 and uh, uh, death, and the light shines. Jesus steps into my life, and now the light turns on. He'll start in the dark, but he'll end in the light. And that's why when you read the Bible, the very first Verses of the Bible says darkness was over the face of the deep. The Bible starts in darkness, but you look at the very last of the Bible and talks about heaven, says there's no night there. God might start in the dark, but he'll end in the light. And when you talk to people who are living in the darkness of sin, it's the light of Jesus that's going to change everything. That's what happened in your life when Jesus stepped in the light turned on. And so the first day is really a picture of the birth of Jesus. The second day, remember this is when the water was separated from the water. It's not the Atlantic from the Pacific. It's talking about the atmosphere, uh, the clouds uh, that carry the rain in the sky, the waters from above, from the waters below. And so uh, this was a, a lifting up of the waters. That is a picture of the death of Jesus. Why? Because in John chapter 3 and verse 14, it says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so also must the Son of Man, Jesus, be lifted up. And he said in John chapter 12, If I am lifted up, I will draw all men to me. And the, the, the Bible says, that he was speaking of his death, <clears throat> if I will lift it up. Now, do you know, it's, this is, I'll just throw this in a little extra. At the end of every day of creation, God said, it is good, it is good, it is good. But if you notice, on day two, God didn't say it is good. That's the only day that is, is not recorded where God said it is good. 
Now, it doesn't mean that it wasn't good. In fact, when we celebrate Easter and the resurrection of Jesus and three days before that, the death of Jesus, I don't know what you call it in Philippines, but in Canada, we call it Good Friday because that's the day that Jesus died. When I was in Ukraine and in Russia, and I was teaching this there at Easter time, I discovered that they don't call Friday Good Friday. They, 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 the translation basically says it's Bad Friday. <laughs> and I, I said to them, uh, in Canada, we say Good Friday, and here you say Bad Friday. Who's right, Canadians or Russians? <laughs> And, you know, we just, I said, is this a good day or a bad day? Well, you know, we decided we were both right. Actually, we're both right. Because it's bad that Jesus had to die, but it's good he did because he paid the price for our sins. And so this was a day that, that spoke. Day two, the lifting up of the one is a, is a symbol of the death of Jesus. All right, let's move to day three. Oh, I love day three. Why day three? Because Jesus told his disciples that he would suffer, he would be killed, and he would uh, arise from the dead on what day? Day three. He said, the third day I will rise again. So what happened on creation on the third day? Well, we see that the earth was all buried by the water, but now there's a resurrection. The earth comes up out of the water, and there is a resurrection of the earth. And not only that, out of that comes life. Out of the earth rises life, plant life, and all kinds of vegetation. Day three, for sure, is a picture of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. When Peter was preaching in Acts chapter 10 and verse 40, he reminded the people that God raised Jesus from the dead on the third day, he said, and showed him openly. Wow, that is just a wonderful thing. There's, um, there, there are a lot of scriptures that I've given you there in that chart. Matthew chapter 16 and Mark and Luke and Acts all refer to the fact that Jesus would rise on the third day. So Jesus' resurrection is the first day of life as well. And so day three is a wonderful picture of the resurrection of Jesus. Okay, let's move on to day four. So day one is his birth. Day two re uh, speaks, it's just pictures of his, of his uh, birth. And then day two is of his death. Day three, picture of his, pictures of his resurrection. And day four is a picture of his ascension or move, or going up into glory. The Bible says that he uh, sat, uh, he was raised and is sitting at the right hand of God. It's interesting to me when we talk about the days of creation that on day four, nothing happens on earth. Day four is not an earth day at all. Day four is a day of the heavenlies. And day four speaks of the ascension of Jesus, or moving up, or lifting up from the earth. Um, Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 1 says, the main point is that Jesus is our high priest, seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Oh, I like that. <clears throat> or Ephesians chapter 1 and verse uh, 20. It says that Jesus was raised from the dead and was seated at the right hand of God in heavenly places. Oh, I like that. And so there, day four is a, is a picture of Jesus and the work that he does for us now as our high priest. Uh, the, the, uh, that uh, Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25 says that Jesus ever lives to make intercession for us. Oh, that's wonderful. That's why when we pray, we pray in Jesus' name. We're praying to the Father through the Lord Jesus, who has paid the penalty of our sin, and now 
is sitting, sitting at the right hand of the Father on high. Well, that's a wonderful thing. Now, remember, I talked about the greater light that rules the day and the lesser light that rules the night. The greater light, of course, is the sun. The lesser light that was created on day four is the moon. Well, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 that we are children of the day. So the greater light would be Jesus who rules us the day. The lesser light is us who reflect Jesus into the dark world. Like the moon reflects the light of the sun, we reflect the light of Jesus into this world. And that's why the Bible says, uh, Jesus said in Matthew 5, let your light so shine before men that they will see your good works, but that they'll glorify your Father who is in heaven. Oh, wow. Okay, let's move on to day five now. Day five, remember the birds and the fish uh, were created, and they were created in abundance. And I believe that that is a picture of the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came because the, the, uh, Jesus is the Lord of abundant life uh, from the highest heaven, that's the birds, to the lowest parts of the earth, that's the fish that can go down to the bottom of the sea and everywhere. The glory of the Spirit of God uh, is, a is a spirit of abundance. And it's interesting, too, that there are two symbols of the Christian church. One is a dove, a bird, and the other is a fish. Um, and that, that's interesting to me, that those are symbols of the church. And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, he said, I will build my church church. Now remember, the church is not, I know that there are many denominations, and I've, I've preached in many different churches that have different uh, 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 uniquenesses to them, but we all agree that Jesus Christ is our Savior, our Lord, our coming King, that Jesus Christ is God, the Bible is the Word of God, and that's the church. The church isn't a building. The church isn't a denomination. The church are people who are born of the Spirit of God. That's the church. Jesus said, I will build my church. We don't know how many are in the church because it's all over the world. People from all kinds of, of um, backgrounds but as long as you love Jesus with all your heart and are a believer in Jesus, you, you're part of the church. You're what Jesus is building. In Acts chapter 5 and verse 14, it says the believers were increasingly added to the church, multitudes, both men and women. And um, Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 19, or verse 9, says that the um, that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea, just like the, you know, the fish under the sea. Um, that's also found in uh, the Old Testament book of Habakkuk, chapter 2 and verse 14. Uh, and then in Revelation um, 19 and verse 6, when we're talking about uh, John had a vision of the huge number of Christians and believers. Uh, the the um, Revelation 19 verse 6 said, John said, I heard the voice of a great multitude. It was like the sound of many waters. And so day five is really a picture of the church, the Holy Spirit coming in, and the great multitude of believers that are coming to Christ. Day six now, let's move to day six. Oh, I like day six, because day six was when Adam and Eve were created, and man was given dominion over the earth. God said, this earth is yours. It belongs to you. You own it now. And you have, to, in other words, you're the king. And that's why when they sinned, they, they destroyed what God had given them as a gift, they gave, they gave their gift away to Satan. Imagine that. That's why Jesus called Satan the prince of this world. Adam was the prince of this world, and he gave it away. Well, we'll talk about that another time, but um, 
But when we come to day six and realize that that was the day that man was given dominion, but he sinned and wrecked it, now we talk about the second Adam, Jesus, who will come again, and he will have dominion, the Bible says, over this whole earth. He will restore it. He will be the king. He will be the owner. And this kingdom of Jesus will never end. <clears throat> so the day six is, re is referring to the second coming of Jesus. Um, and the fact that um, Zechariah, the Old Testament prophet, said in Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 10, his dominion shall be from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth, Jesus will reign. Um, uh, 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 11 says that to him will be the glory and dominion forever and ever. That's also in Jude, verse 25. And Revelation uh, chapter 11 and verse 15 says, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Oh, I just praise the Lord to know that Jesus Christ is going to take over this world. He'll be the king. He is the second Adam who paid the penalty that the first Adam uh, made for us. But Jesus now will have dominion from sea to sea, and he will be our king and our Lord. Isn't that wonderful? So there are the days of creation kind of sh painting little pictures of Jesus all the way through the story of the Lord Jesus. Uh, his birth, day one. Day two, his death. Day three, his resurrection. Day four, his ascension and his high priestly work in heaven. Day five, the coming of the uh, Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost in the church. Day six is the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then again, in um, um, the, the, seven, the day seven is a day of rest. And that's where we can go again, as we mentioned earlier. In Revelation chapter 19 and verse 30, where the Lord said, it's finished. The work, um, no, John, John 19 and verse 30 is where Jesus on the cross said it is finished. And, uh, and then in Revelation, we are told that uh, we, uh, that what Jesus has done, uh, the heaven and everything, that's all finished. We talked about that. And, um, and then we rest. And there is, again, a great principle of coming to the rest of the Lord Jesus Christ, to saying, Jesus, I believe in you. I receive your gift of eternal life. Everything you did on the cross, you did for me. If I was the only person in the world that needed a Savior, Jesus, you would have died for me. You loved me that much. Jesus loves you that much. He gave his life, but he didn't stay dead. He's God. You can't kill life. And he rose from the dead. And he said, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So when we come to Jesus, we're able just to rest in him. That's what faith is. Do you know, sometimes I think we struggle too much as Christians in trying to get answers to prayer and trying to see stuff done. And we think that it's all about us. No, it's about just putting it in the hands of Jesus and trusting him. Do you know, when I was a young man, I, uh, I loved to swim. And I actually went to a school, a big school in the city of Toronto, that had an Olympic-sized swimming pool in the school. And so I took swimming lessons, and I got special med medallions and uh, awards for swimming. And I remember I was being taught how to be a lifeguard and how to save somebody who was drowning. And I learned a very interesting lesson because, um, you know, if someone is drowning and they're out in the water and their water is over their head and they're, they're afraid, they start to fight and flail and say, get you know, a mouthful of water and they say, oh, help me, save me. And then the lifeguard goes out to 
rescue him and to pull him into shore and to, and to safety. Well, I've heard that uh, sometimes uh, they, the person that's drowning is so afraid, they just grab onto everything and they'll grab onto the lifeguard and pull him down and cause him to drown too. So it can be, they saying it can be very dangerous if someone is frantic and afraid and fly, you know, their hands are flying and they're, they're, they're screaming and they're afraid. Uh, it, it's, so they taught us, this is part of my swimming lessons, they taught us how to break certain holds. They grab you around the, the arm and they won't let go. They showed us how to break that hold. If they grab you around the neck, they showed us how to break that kind of a hold on you. So, so this is how we were taught to save a drowning person. And then after they told us all those things, they said, but there's still a better way. I thought, oh, okay, what's the better way? The better way is to swim out to where they are and don't touch them, just stay away from them. What? I think if I stay away from them, they're gonna drown. No, if they're fighting and screaming, they're, st they're still quite alive, actually. Oh, yeah, I never thought of that. They're, yeah, they're alive. <laughs> so get out close to where they are, but don't touch them. Let them scream and let them fight and, and just tread water and be close to them, but don't touch them. And eventually, they'll get so tired of fighting they'll give up. Then you can go in and then you can save them and pull them to shore and everything's going to be okay. And I thought, now that is the way it is with us and Jesus many times. We say, Jesus, why don't you help me? I don't understand. Why aren't you coming to my help? And we're fighting and we're throwing our arms all around and we're screaming and we're saying, I don't understand why this isn't working and why, Jesus, you don't come and help me. And all the time, the Lord's just right there, real close. He's just saying, you know, if you stop fighting and start trusting me and learn how to rest in me, you'll discover that I will save you from this situation. So many of things in life begin with resting in Jesus. And all of our fighting, all of our screaming, all of our exercise, trying to save ourselves and yelling and blaming and whatever, it, it's not going to help. What helps is when I just rest and let Jesus do the work for me. And so that's why Hebrews chapter 4 says, we who have believed, if you're really trusting him, then you enter his rest. Oh, I, I like that. God has a good plan. Now, I think we have time to start our chart a little bit today. We won't get everything done, but let's look at this chart again. And you have it on the front page of your, of your book. And you also have it inside on uh, one of these pages, the, a big chart, you see, on page one of your notes after the index. And then on the top of every page, you have just a little, a, a, a little small picture of this chart so that you can kind of keep following through the book, even though you don't have to always turn back to the first pages. So... Here is the chart here. And I designed this chart in such a way that we could just see it in a simple form. Uh, I've seen many Bible prophecy charts that are filled with lines and designs and words and everything. And I tried to make this simple so that I could just see it myself. I like simple things, actually. I can understand it better that way. And uh, so we start with creation. Actually, this starts before creation, and we talked about that last week, how God created the heavens and the earth. Now, finally, God steps into this earth that is dark and formless and void, and he says, let there be light, and creation starts. And then, finally, he makes Adam and Eve, and he puts them in the garden. So each of these circles represent a different time zone through human history. The Bible doesn't tell us about everything that happened way back there. 
And it doesn't tell us about everything that's going to happen in the future. Many things it does tell us about, but not everything. And um, no, there's lots of things that are still yet to happen. But the Bible basically is the story of man, of our creation, the fall of sin, and how God restored it through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why the cross is in the middle. And on through the various time zones that we live until the end of this is the time zone we live in now, time zone number six, which is the day of grace. We'll talk about that and how this ends with the dead in Christ rising and we who are alive are caught up together with them in the air and we're, ever, we're forever with the Lord. And the Bible then gives us a great picture of things that are going to happen after the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll get into that but not today. Okay, and that's very, very exciting, by the way. So let's go right back to the first time zone. We'll discover as we go through these time zones, and I won't go into great detail. You can do as much detail of this as you want if you want to study each one. But each one begins with a promise and ends with a catastrophe or a sin or uh, a judgment, shall, I, shall we say, where something has gone wrong. And um, uh, they, it, it all begins with, a, every one of these begins by God making a promise. There's a promise at day one, at, at, at zone one, or dispensation, we'll call it. There's another promise at number two, number three, four, five, six. There's a promise that begins every one of these time zones. Okay, what's the promise at day one, at the, um, the first dispensation? You'll notice that, uh, where will we find this on your notes? Okay. Um, I want you to be able to see it. It's on page seven of your notes, okay? If you want to see that, I've given you references there um, all the way through. And we don't have time to uh, look up every reference but God has made promises that everyone, let's just look at Genesis chapter 1, uh, verse 28, because that's the promise that begins this first dispensation of time. All right. God said, God bless them, Adam and Eve. And God said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. Have dominion over the fish, the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. God says, this is yours. I promise. It's your, it's your world. And uh, there was the beginning of an absolutely wonderful and perfect world. So it begins with a promise. But every one of these time zones, there's a test. God wants to see how obedient we are to following his instructions. And when we go our own way and we fail the test, there's going to be a catastrophe. There's going to be a judgment. There's going to be consequences for sin. And we'll see that at every one of these circles or every one of these dispensations or time zones throughout man's history. So what happened? God put a tr uh, two trees in the garden. It was a beautiful garden, the Garden of Eden. But what was in the Garden of Eden? Two particular trees. One was the tree of life. The second was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God said, listen, eat of any tree you want except that one tree. Just don't go and eat of that tree. Well, isn't it interesting that that's the one tree that really attracted them? Have you ever told a child, don't touch that thing? And the very first thing they want to do is go and touch it because you told them not to. I don't know. They're, they're, they're testing you or something. Uh, but maybe, maybe Canadian children are different than Filipino children. I don't know. But if you say to a Canadian child, now, don't you touch that, they'll probably go straight to it and touch it. Uh, anyway. Uh, God said, don't go to that tree. And you know what's interesting? The tree of life gave them eternal life. When they were 
kicked out of the garden, they were kicked out so that they would not have access to the tree of life. So I believe that they, they ate of the tree of life regularly. They could. They, that was part of, part of the deal. They were allowed to eat of that tree. In fact, by eating of it, they would continue to live forever, really. And so, um, uh, you know, sometimes we have a picture that, that they never ate of the tree of life and or if they did, one bite would go, whoa, and then all of a sudden they live forever through one bite. No, it was the continual eating of that tree that would give them life, of the fruit of that tree. Which is interesting, because that tree is going to be in heaven, but we'll talk about that later. Okay, but the second tree was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God said, don't eat of that tree. Of course, Satan seduced them and Eve especially into um, eating of that tree and the fruit looked so good to her and it's interesting in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6 oh, oh we could spend five hours on this one verse uh, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desired to make one wise, she ate of its fruit, and she gave her husband, her uh, who was with her, the fruit, and he ate it too. You see the three things, three things that she saw about that fruit. What was the three things? Number one, it was good for food. Just think of that word if you want to write down the word food. Uh, and it was pleasant to the eyes. There's the second one. Eyes, food, number one, eyes, number two, and desire to make one wise. Oh, that's number three, food, eyes, and wise. Now, why is that important? Because she saw three things about that tree. Do you know what? This was the knowledge of good and evil. It was not just the tree of the knowledge of evil. Think about that. It's not just evil that keeps people away from God. Goodness keeps people away from God too. Why? Because some people, they say, well, I'm not a bad person. I never stole anything. I never hurt anybody. I never murdered anybody. I'm a good person. <coughs> And because of their goodness, they think that they're okay with God. In fact, I kind of think that goodness has kept more people away from God than evil. I know that when I talk to my neighbors and my friends who don't know the Lord and tell them all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, they say, well, I'm not a sinner. I didn't do anything all that bad. I never did, you know, they start to name terrible things that criminals do. Listen, all of us have sinned. All of us have come short of the glory of God. And I, I actually preached a sermon one time, and I, the title of my sermon was, Good Sinners Are the Worst Kind of Sinners. <laughs> because people who are good, it's hard to convince them that they need a Savior. If someone's really bad and they know they're bad, they know they've sinned and done bad things, it's easy to tell them, you know, you're a bad person. You need a savior. Yeah, I know. But someone who's a good person, and we've got a lot of good people that live around us, it's hard to convince them, you know what, you're a sinner and you need a savior. In fact, I was talking to um, a young man uh, a while ago and uh, I was leading him in a sinner's prayer, and we prayed together. He wanted Jesus in his life, and I was helping him pray, and he was repeating after me, dear Jesus, come into my life. He said, dear, come in. I know I have, uh, I'm a sinner, and I need you, Jesus. He repeated, I'm the sinner, and I need you, Jesus. Come and forgive my sins, and he repeated it, and then the next day, he phoned me. He said, why did you make me say I was a sinner? I'm not a sinner. <laughs> and I thought, oh, he missed the whole point. I said, all of us have said, no, he said, 
my brother, and he, t he told me of something, some bad thing that his brother had done. He said, he's the sinner, not me. You see, that tree was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We all have missed the mark. Ro um, Romans um, 3 and 23 says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, here's another thing I notice about that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This is what Eve saw about the tree. She saw that the tree was good for food. Oh boy, that fruit looks so delicious. And then it was pleasant to the eyes. It was pretty. It really looked nice. And then it was desire to make one. Oh, I'll be a lot smarter if I eat that. In fact, I'll be like God. That's what, that's what the serpent told me. I'll be like God. Well, do you know what that is? That is a description of everything about sin. If you were to talk about sin and put it into three lists or three categories, everything would fall under those things. In fact, if you look at First, um, first John chapter 2 and verse 16, First John chapter 2, verse 16. Let's look at that verse, okay? 1 John chapter 2 and verse 16. Well, let's start at verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. Now, when that's talking about the world, it's not talking about, about the people that are in the world that the Lord loves. Because John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his son. When it's talking about do not love the world here, it's talking about the, the system of the world, the way the world works. The, the system of, of revolving around sin and power and all that. Do not love the world or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Okay, so now verse 16 defines what the word world means. Okay, for all that is in the world, look at the word all. Everything about the world can be summed up in these three things. Number one, the lust of the flesh. Number two, the lust of the eyes. Number three, the pride of life. Isn't that interesting? The lust, let's, you know, let's go back and forth from that verse back to Eve. Eve saw that the tree was good for for food. What's that? The lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh has, has everything to do with satisfying this body, this flesh. Appetites. Uh, it could be food. It could be drugs. It could be alcohol. It could be things that have to do with the flesh. Uh, it could be sex and sexual sins, but it has to do with satisfying the flesh. That's category number one. Everything in the world has to do with, number one, satisfying the flesh, and that's what Eve saw. Number two, she saw that it was pleasant to the eyes. Oh, isn't that interesting? And that's what uh, verse 16 of 1 John 1 or 2 says, that uh, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, <coughs> excuse me, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the eyes has to do with pretty things or nice things and um, wanting something more. It, it has to do with money. It has to do with, with glamour and glitter and uh, always doing one better than the next. My neighbor has, a, he's got a nice um whatever so i'm gonna have to do one better than him because uh i you know that's that's what you call the lust of the eyes not being satisfied with what god has given to us and always trying to uh, accumulate wealth and money some people think if i just had more money and i was really really rich and i was a millionaire oh that's what i want and like no that's the lust of the eyes now interesting let me go back God knows that I need to eat. God knows that I need a house to live in or a place to live. 
It's not that we don't need those things. In fact, in, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And it says, you know, the world goes after what will I wear and what will I eat and all this. He said, the world, and then he goes on to say, your, your father knows that you need those things. You see, God doesn't come and say, you don't need food. Of course we need food. But to gouge our appetite until we become gluttons, that's not right. Well, the, the Lord knows that I need things to satisfy the, even sex. The Lord has built, so I've heard people say, well, God made me this way. Some young men that want to commit adultery, they say, well, God made me this way. Well, maybe God made you that way. And he understands that, but God has also put boundaries around how that operates. And it, and you work within God's boundaries and that's okay. But when you go outside of the boundaries that God has given to you, that is lust. See, appetite is normal. I have an appetite for food. I have an appetite for uh, satisfying my flesh. Some of those appetites are normal, but lust, here's a definition of lust, okay? Appetite out of control. That's what appetite is. Appetite, I mean, that's what lust is. Lust is appetite out of control. Now, picture this. A train, you know, people say, um, well, I want to be free. I want to be able to do whatever I want to do. And freedom, listen, true freedom is not doing everything you want to do. Freedom is living within the boundaries of God, what God made you to be and what God made you to do. That's true freedom. Let me explain. If a train is going down the train tracks, okay, and it can go full speed down the train tracks, okay, let's just make the train into a person for a minute. And the train looks over at the lake as, it, as it's going down the train tracks. Look at that boat out there. I wish I could be out there on the lake. I'm stuck to these silly old tracks here. I want to be out on the lake. And he goes farther down the tracks and he sees a car on a road and he says, oh, that car can drive over there. I would, I wish I could be there. And I wish I'm just stuck on these tracks because I'd like to be there where that car is. You know, I know it's a silly illustration, but imagine if the train jumps the tracks to get over to the lake or jumps the tracks to get over to the road where the car, do you know what's going to happen to the train? It's going to crash. Why? Because the train was not made for the lake and it was not made for the road. It was made for those tracks. And if the train wants real freedom, if it really wants to go, stay on the tracks. Follow me? Stay on the tracks. And if we want real freedom, sometimes we, oh, I just want to do this. Or I just want to do that. No, 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 no. If that isn't the track that God made for you, you're not coming into freedom. You're coming into a wreck, into bondage. Stay on the tracks that God has given to you. The lust of the flesh means that you've got off the track. The lust of the eyes means that you're off the track. You're, you're seeking for something that isn't what God has for you. And then the third in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, is the pride of life. The, oh, pride. Now, isn't that interesting? Because here was the third thing that Eve noticed about the tree in Genesis 3, verse 6. That the tree, it was a lie, but it was desirable to make one wise. Oh, I'm going to be smart. I'm going to know things. And that's the pride of life. Interesting. Interesting. That is the very thing that the Lord told us to avoid. In fact, the devil was not kicked out of heaven because of the lust of the flesh, nor because of the lust of the eyes. He had everything. He was kicked out of heaven because of pride. I am going to be in charge. I'm going to be God. I'm going to be number one here. That's pride. 
And that's exactly what, uh, uh, why God kicked him out of the, um, the uh, heavens because of pride. So I always call pride the devil's sin. Now, it's interesting, too, if you look over in Matthew, this is interesting, and, and you look at the temptations of Jesus, and you see the way he was tempted, in Matthew chapter 4, he was tempted three different ways. Oh, interesting. Turn the stones into bread. That's the lust of the flesh. If, uh, what's the other one? Um, and um, if you turn... If you are the son of God, he said, um, jump off this bill, uh, off the, the temple and let's, let's see what you can do. That's just pride. Jesus said, no, I'm not, I'm not doing that. Um, uh, and, and then the, the third, look at all the kingdoms of the world. Look at all this stuff. I'll give you all these things. That's the lust of the eyes. Jesus was tempted in all those three ways, even as Eve was back there. And as we're warned about in 1 John. And so there are, again, there's a lesson right there about sin and about what sin will do to us. And I, we need to realize again that God has warned us right from the beginning, just be careful, stay on the tracks. Well, God wants uh, to guide us through life. He wants goodness for us. He wants, he wants us to be prosperous. I'm not saying God doesn't want us to uh, enjoy life and be prosperous and be wise and all that. He wants all of that for us, but in his terms, in his way, and that's what real freedom is. <clears throat> freedom, again, is not doing everything you want to do. It's freedom is doing everything God has designed you to do then you're really free. That's why the Bible says, if the Son sets you free, the Son of God, Jesus, if he sets you free, you will be free indeed. And so the last thing I'm going to tell you before we close today is that this first dispensation ends with that catastrophe when, when Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden because they sinned. It started out wonderful, but then they sinned. And so the promise ends with a catastrophe. And what happened? Um, <clears throat> we move into the next uh, uh, dispensation. And you'll see that the symbol that I have is a foot on top of the head of, say, uh, of a snake. What that is, is a reference to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. And this is a very important verse because it's the very first prophecy in the Bible about the Jesus Christ coming as our Savior and crushing the head of Satan. Here's what it says, and this is God speaking to the, to the, the, the serpent or Satan. He said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall, he, referring to Jesus, shall bruise your head and he shall bruise your heel. Okay, enmity between your seed and her seed. In my Bible, her seed, the word seed has a capital S. In other words, it's a person. It's Jesus Christ. And it's her seed. Usually seed is a reference to the male part of conception. But here it's a reference to her seed, which says that Jesus is going to be born of a virgin. It's her seed, and you uh, will, he, he will bruise your head, you'll bruise his heel. In other words, he's going to get hurt. His heel, have you ever stepped on a snake and, and you hurt your foot? But there's a big difference between getting your foot bruised and getting your head crushed. And Jesus uh, crushed Satan's head at the cross. And I'm so thankful. This is the prophecy, the very first prophecy in the Bible about the coming of Jesus. Uh, he will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. Now, he'll get hurt, but you're going to get hurt way, way worse. And what Jesus did on the cross, we'll talk about this another day. What Jesus did on the cross was complete victory for us over Satan. Now we say, 
<clears throat> Satan still seems to be alive and well on earth, and he's still doing bad things. Well, that's true. <clears throat> but remember, Jesus won the victory at the cross. And when I rest in what Jesus did at the cross, I live not for the victory, but from the victory. I'm already in the victory in Jesus. And yes, I've, I tell you, I've stepped on a snake in my life and crushed it, and I know it was dying, but it still kept writhing and wriggling. Satan, uh, snakes do that. Well, Satan's head has been crushed, and he's still writhing and wriggling, but the day will come when he'll end up in the lake of fire, and it'll be totally over. So even though we do see activity from Satan, we'll say, I tell you, he's finished. Jesus finished him at the cross, and my victory is in Jesus, and I praise the Lord for that. I really, really do. So there is a wonderful, wonderful thing to uh, come to an end on, to realize that I can just come to the Lord Jesus Christ, say, Jesus, you did it all for me, and I'm going to rest in everything that you did for me, and I'm going to keep my eyes on Jesus, I'm going to stay on the track that you've laid out for me in the Word of God, and I'm going to discover such freedom, such joy, such peace, because I'm living where you want me to live. That's my relationship with Jesus. So all I can say about that is praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Jocelyn, did you have anything that you wanted to um, say as, as we're closing out and have somebody pray? Wow. Uh, <laughs> I think I can only say, wow, I, uh, this is so much. I mean, in just one sitting here there, and Oh, there's just so much in it, Pastor Craig. Oh, wow. How I wish. Um, there will be, the, uh, I mean, more to, uh, to be in here so they can get what you are teaching. It's just so much. Even just day one, I'm still on day one. I, I, I mean, my note is still on day one, and it's and one page is full. And uh, wow, thank you so much. Praise uh, the Lord. Well, there's so much, and we do thank the Lord because uh, there's there's other things that you know when I'm listening to other people teach, sometimes it's just one little tidbit of something they say that really rings in my heart, and I think. Ah, oh, that is really special. And I want to think about that. And that's why uh, Joshua chapter 1 verse 8 says that we should meditate on his word day and night. We should think about it. And there are things that we've talked about today that we can think about some more. Um, I, I, I like the word meditate because it's like, um, th this is a strange illustration, but my uh, my I lived in a city in Canada, but my grandfather was on a farm and he had cows on the farm milking cows. And um, I discovered that a cow has three stomachs. And that's interesting. Yeah. And so have you ever noticed a cow mm, all the time they're, they They say they're chewing their cud. Mm. And what is happening? It sounds a little bit uh, ugly, but uh, a cow takes the hay or, or grass and chews it and then swallows it. It goes into its first stomach. And then eventually it comes, this is, this is ugly, but it comes up again and they chew it some more and swallow it and it goes into the second stomach. And then it comes up again and they chew it some more. And I think, whoa. They get all the good they can out of that grass. Well, that is what meditation is. I take the word of God. I, sw I put it in my spiritual mouth. And I chew it. Mm -hmm, mm, and I swallow it. And then tomorrow, I think about it some more. I bring it up again. And I 
start to chew it some more and think about it some more. And then I swallow that. Well, that's what meditation is, where I just keep thinking. I keep bringing back to the surface the things that God has said to me, and I chew it some more and get some more good out of it, some more spiritual vitamins, and I swallow it again. And there's always more to see as we look at the Word of God and think about it some more. And that's why you, the Bible is a different kind of a book. I've got I like reading books, but there are books that I've read. Okay, I've read. Now I can put, maybe I, it's so good I can read it twice. Put them on the shelf. The Bible isn't that kind of a book. I can read it every day, all the days of my life, and still learn more things from it. That's why it's the Word of God. And so that's why it's so important for us to keep meditating and chewing on the Word of God and getting more, the Spirit of God brings more spiritual vitamins and more good things out of it for me. Joshua 1 and verse 8. <laughs> well, thank you so much for uh, putting a lot into it, chewing <laughs> it, and making it uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> softer for us to take. Good. <laughs> wow. Uh, I mean, good. how many years you have to do that, Pastor Craig, and you've been <laughs> doing it, and now it's coming out, and at least, uh, you know, we are taking it, uh, you know, uh, so we can understand. Well, praise the Lord. I thank the Lord for that. Do you know, when I told you Joshua 1 and 8, 1 and 8 I don't have my Bible open, but I know it's there. Do you know why I know it's there? because my mother taught me to memorize that verse when I was four years old. And that was more than 70 years ago. And I still have that verse in my head. Joshua chapter one, verse eight. I learned it when I was four years old. And so, I mean, God wants us to keep meditating on his word all the time. God bless you. Wow. May I pray with you now, just to sum up? Okay? Yes, please, Pastor Craig. Father in heaven, I just thank you for your precious word. I thank you for the jewels, the gems, the gold that we find in your word when we dig deep and find that you have treasures there for us to discover. Help us, Lord God, not just to be students of your word in our heads, but in our lives, in our walk, in our conduct, day by day. May we be people who live out the word of God and show to others that Jesus is wonderful. His life is real. His way is the only true way. And it leads to heaven and joy and peace and rest. So help us, Lord, to continue to meditate on your word. And I thank you for every one of my precious brothers and sisters who are in the Philippines, Lord. I wish I could just hug every one of them and let them know how much I love them. And I pray that the Jesus Christ will be made real to them as they put their head down to sleep tonight, as they wake up tomorrow to a new day. May they realize, Lord, that every day is a day that you have made, a day to rejoice and to be glad in. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. For more information on our ministries, please visit my website at inthewaitingministries.com. I'd invite you to also check out my YouTube channel, and I'm also on Facebook at In The Waiting Ministries.